Welcome everyone. Welcome. I'm going to take my place behind the table really quickly. So welcome everyone to our weekly Tuesday Treasures. My name is Nicole Carpenter. I'm the Director of Programs and Education here at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. And our Tuesday Treasure Program is a weekly program we hold on Tuesdays. Uh, that is all about highlights from our collection, where I show you different pieces uh, that come from our archives and our different textiles of, uh, sorry, our collections of textiles and artifacts. Tonight, you are joining me on a very special Tuesday. Tonight is actually um, Giving Tuesday, which is May 5th today. We do ask tonight, all of us from the museum, that you support nonprofits and museums today. Uh, we do have a suggested donation of $5 if you would like to support the museum and the free programming that we offer. But we do, of course, understand this is a difficult time. And we do ask you to, to give whatever you have the means and are comfortable with giving. So thank you so much in advance uh, for all of your support and all the support we've already received from our very generous audience. So tonight, we are going to take part in a little bit of a game. Again, not difficult, not a very difficult game at all, but you are expected to participate this evening. I also want to let you know that I have a very special object to show you at the end of tonight's broadcast that actually has to do with one of our previous topics of air wardens. So hang around till the, till the very end of the video and I will show you one object that we just discovered um, that we didn't even know that we had until uh, we did that broadcast and we're looking a little bit more closely into it. So tonight, the very first thing that I'm going to ask all of you to do is in the comments, I would like you to let me know which of our items, there are two pairs of items tonight, which out of the pair is the true historic artifact? So tonight we have two dresses, uh, both equally lovely, both showing the same period. And so you can see a little better, we have two top hats this evening as well. So I'm going to show you one of our true reproductions in collections first. While I'm doing that, I want you to, to really look at these pieces as well as you can through the camera and let me know which of the two pairs, again, of the dresses, and of the top hats you believe are real versus reproduction. Let me grab our first item that I am going to show you while we are guessing. The museum's reproduction collection or our education collection is made up of garments that can be worn. Now this item is depicting a jacket from uh, the Revolution, Revolutionary War, the War of Independence. And this is a jacket that a Continental Army um, uh, recruit would have been wearing probably later in the war uh, when the, the uniform was a bit more um, red, was a bit more regulated. Uh, so one of the reasons that we can tell this is a reproduction is one, because of the material. Uh, this is made of a kind of cotton polyester blend. Uh, the time period, it would have been wool. So that's a big giveaway to us. Also, garments from the revolution are uncommon. Uh, this piece is in very good condition. Um, it's always, so it's always something that we look at when we look at a piece is its age versus its condition. Uh, again, there are true period pieces out there from the revolution that are in impeccable shape, but they are rare. And as you move back in time, uh, it gets rarer and rarer for, to find garments. Uh, 17th century garments are very, very rare. And then as you move into uh, the Middle Ages and um, uh, things like that. It's it's really difficult to find intact, very good condition garments such as such as this. Uh, so that is a, a big giveaway. And then also the construction of the garment. So this piece, 
This piece, if you look on the inside, you can actually see machine stitching. If you look along the collar, you can see how even uh, the stitching is um, down the middle. Also, the lining is in extremely good condition. We would expect to see um, staining around the arms and around the collar, and we just don't. So this is a very, very good indication that this particular piece, um, while lovely, and our, our volunteers love wearing it, is a reproduction. This is not a true piece from the uh, 1800s or from the 1700s, definitely not. So we do have some guesses. Actually, let me read them off. So we do have a guess from Sarah. She believes the hat on the left. Now let me think. Which one is your left? that these two are the real pieces. She says our left. So yes, I'm assuming that means these two pieces. Uh, we also have a guest from Marie who believes that the blue dress with buttons is a reproduction. I'm guessing you are assuming this piece with the very, very prominent buttons. Um, both dresses actually do have buttons. This one is just much, much more uh, subtle with um, their buttons. I'll give you just a second longer to, to take a guess. Again, even though they are, one is a true piece and one is a reproduction, they're both, um, both top hats, both dresses are extremely well made. Um, they're both, perfectly fine to to show off a period it's just that one is truly from the period and the other is a reproduction <laughs> so i will tell you the dress that is real is the piece over on the left so sarah you were correct um, this dress over on the left on my right side this is a true dress from the 1880s. It's actually made from silk. It is a gray color with a navy blue trim, um, all silk. It does have a lining, which I'll show you in just a moment, which is also made of silk on the inside. This was donated by the former owner of um, a house in Westport. It's actually 189 uh, Imperial Avenue. And that was the former home of John Dolan, who was the police chief in Westport. Uh, I believe he was chief of police from 1937 to 1957. Uh, again, if someone knows um, of other periods or would like to send any articles in or anything like that, please do. We're always expanding our knowledge on Westport and our history. So in his home, this dress, as well as some other artifacts were found by a later owner and were donated to the museum. Um, some pictures of John actually in some of his memorabilia um, from his time on the police force were found. We do believe that this dress was probably owned by John's mother or his mother-in-law. Um, John is born just at the turn of the, the um, 20th century, uh, and this dress from the 1880s would not be appropriate for his children or even his wife to be wearing. So it's most likely from uh, either his mother or his mother-in-law. This reproduction, we can tell is reproduction one because of the material. Again, I, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is made of a, a cotton polyester blend, whereas this dress is made of a silk and you can actually see the individual um, threads of that, uh, that silk thread. Uh, if you take a look at this dress, you'll also see that these buttons are made of plastic. And on the inside, there is no lining. It is simply just machine stitched. Um, it does have this lovely little bonnet that goes along with it um, that you're putting your hair. And you can also see that it has almost like a plasticky um, mesh on the inside. Um, another good indicator that, that it is in not an extreme period piece. 
on the true 1880s dress, if you can see just a tad on the inside, let me stand over here so the light's a little better. Um, you can see the lining on the inside. Um, if you, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but just along this top edge uh, where the lining and the dress come together, you can see these stitches that are hand done. Um, the angle very, uh, has a variation between the individual stitches and then the length or the space in between stitches um, varies slightly as well. The buttons are made of mother of pearl, a very good indication of the time. So between the material and the uh, stitching, we have a very good indication that this is a period piece. Um, also, the condition of the dress, we do see small stainings, we do see small condition pieces that can be um, fixed. Some of them can. Um, not all restoration is appropriate for a piece like this, but we, this is a very, very good indication that this is a period piece and it has been, um, again, authenticated by uh, the donors and by uh, costume historians. Very, very lovely. The other thing that is surprising about these two dresses is this blue dress, this reproduction, is actually smaller than the true um, extant garment, the actual period garment. Uh, the waist measurement on this dress is actually over 30 inches, which is uh, just here at the waist, um, which in today's sizing would probably be a um, medium to large. Uh, I do hope you will join us next week when we are going over um, kind of foundation garments like corsets and chemises and um, crinolines. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about these true waist sizes um, of period dresses. So let's move on to the top hats. I know that Sarah had a guess for the hat. He believes it's true. We also have a guest from Margaret who believes that the dress on, or sorry, that the hat on your right, so this hat is the true hat. And I do see the comment that um, we're having a bit of a uh, volume problem. So I will try to stay a bit closer to the camera so you can hear me very clearly. So the, the true uh, top hat that we see here tonight is actually this hat here um, on your, I believe your right. Uh, this piece, let me bring it a bit closer. This piece is a top hat. This is made of silk. Uh, this is a slightly different kind of uh, silk process. You'll see that it looks a bit different from the silk of the dress. Um, this almost has a uh, softness to it. You can see it a little bit here. So the material, again, is a huge indication of what is true, but also construction. In this case, we can see that the brim, the body, and the top of the hat are actually all separate pieces. If you look really closely here, you can see the individual stitches that uh, put the, the body and the top of the top hat together, this little seam here. You can also see the wear on this top edge uh, with just a little bit of the lining showing through. That is a very good indication that this is a true period piece. The other thing that lets us know that this is a period piece is on the inside of the hat. And I do hope you can see the logo that's in there. It's a little dragon, but there's a name as well. And it says John F. Fitzgerald of New Haven, uh, Connecticut. And through our uh, archives, through our newspapers, we are able to see that John Fitzgerald was a true um, dealer in hats. He's actually a haberdasher, a haberdashery. He runs a haberdashery, uh, which just means that he deals in men's clothing. Um, 
He operates his business from around 1910 till at least 1912. Um, we find that he advertises in the Yale Current during those periods, um, and that makes sense. It was a very popular time for um, top hats. It's right at the end of the popularity of top hats as uh, bowlers and um, skimmers that we looked at a few weeks ago. Those kind of straw men's hats came into popularity shortly after. The other hat, the other top hat that we have, This hat actually has a bit of stuffing in it, so it'll stay on our stand. But you can see this hat is made, um, unlike the other that has the separate pieces, this is one piece of kind of a, a felt material. Um, it's definitely not um, the same quality as the other piece, and it does have this kind of polyester um, band around the outside. Um, if I take out our stuffing that keeps it in place, um, it does also have a maker's mark on the inside um, along the brim there, if you can see it. It's kind of gold. Um, but again, this is uh, from a, a costume manufacturer. So again, even if something has a maker's mark on the inside, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a true piece. It just means that someone did mark it as they created it. Um, in this case, it is a known um, costuming company that creates this hat. And again, even though these pieces are not real, this dress and this top hat over here, it's really valuable for us as the museum because it lets us uh, dress people in um, items that look true to the period, which can be really, really helpful in teaching about a specific period of time, but also um, to embody a time of the past. It really kind of brings that experience back. I have one final piece for us tonight. really lovely. This is a two-piece um, cocktail dress or kind of suit. Um, this is from the 1950s. On camera, it does look a bit bluer than it is in person. This is a true emerald green, a very, very vibrant emerald green. Um, it's really, I think almost Wizard of Oz green, um, extremely shiny. It is made of satin. Again, it is a 1950s dress. Um, I can take off the jacket just on one side so you can see it almost has a spaghetti um, or thin shoulder strap and some de detailing. Now this dress was owned by Jean Crawford. Um, I am going to set this down because it is rather heavy. It was owned by Jean Crawford. It was actually made for her by her mother, Frances McAbbey. Now, Frances is really remarkable because she makes this dress for Jean. She actually makes several dresses for her. She makes a, um, a college prom dress as well as a honeymoon dress and other dresses that Jean wears to dance practice at the YMCA in Westport. Uh, Frances is even more remarkable. Uh, she served on the garden committee in Westport. She was actually their conservation chairman. Uh, in 1954, she puts out an article urging people to please not forage for greenery in the woods, that it's um, not good to actually pick the forest uh, foliage for reeds and other things like that because of erosion. So she was a conservationist and she was also a businesswoman. Frances, uh, again, the last name is McAbbey. She founds McAbbey Industries Incorporated and she actually patents several women's uh, undergarments and slips in the 1950s. Um, she's really just a remarkable woman. promise one final item uh, related to last week's program. This helmet, you can see it, does have a chin strap included. 
This helmet was worn by William Graves. Let me hold it actually a little closer. So this helmet is painted white, very reminiscent of um, World War I helmets, but this is from World War II. Uh, again, here in Westport, there were air raid wardens um, who served on the Civil Defense uh, Committee, and this is something that they would have been wearing. It does have um, an inner casing on the inside so that you weren't just hitting metal against your head if something were to happen. Uh, and again, this is another piece, just like the dress that I showed you, where we know this is a historical piece because of, again, condition and material, but also provenance. It's extremely important for us at the museum to know the history of an object and to be able to verify that history. Um, again, the, the dress that I just showed you, that emerald green dress, uh, was donated to us by Jean, so she could tell us uh, all about her mother, and there is documentation of um, patents being issued and articles in newspapers to verify the different things uh, that Jean told us. So it's always extremely helpful for us at the museum if you decide to donate an item or you know more about Westport history for a particular item for a particular person to to let us know, but also let us know where you found things. Uh, again, people bring in a lot of things that they find from home. And it's always helpful to know where you found it, um, how you found it, uh, because it gives us a lot of history for that object. Um, to have the family stories for these objects are extremely important for us. And it helps us share that story to the rest of you. Let me go through and see if you have any questions. Again, if you think of something later on, I'm happy to go through your comments later and try and answer those questions for you. And I do see a lot of guests here. Thank you so much for participating. I do have a question from Ramin. She asks, when you get real pieces in at the museum and they are stained, what do you do? Do you just leave it? That depends on a couple of things. Um, one, it depends on how badly stained an item is. Um, most of our garments, we do not touch. It's actually a part of the history of the garment. Uh, we treat it as a part of the garment itself. Um, some stains have a story to it. So again, if uh, a jacket comes in and it's really frayed or stained around the cuffs, we know that it's something that someone worked in a lot or that they saw a lot of use out of. Um, if we have a, a beautiful dress that has um, a stain on it in one particular place, we might know, oh, that looks like a, a spill from a party or something like that. Again, that's not truly verifiable, but it's something that we generally don't um, conserve. If it's something that can be easily fixed, we will assess it and recommend that a conservator actually look at it for us. Again, we don't do a lot of repairs in-house just because no one on our staff is a trained conservator. We are not experts in truly uh, repairing an item. We are our professional experience is in preserving and presenting and protecting these items so that we can share them all with you. When we find an item that needs care, we try to, one, either ask that we not keep it at the museum because we might not be able to care for it properly, or if we do choose to take it into our collection, knowing there are issues, we will contact a conservator and try to have them take a look at it for us. If you have, actually this brings up a good topic, if you have a piece at home that you want uh, to take stains out of, or you have an old piece like that, um, I do generally recommend getting in contact with a conservator. 
Um, if you type in uh, a textile conservator or art conservator, they can, they'll come up in a Google search. They will give you extremely good advice on what to do for your particular garment or artifact. It definitely depends on the material and also the time period that your artifact or textile is from, how they would recommend to uh, conserve it. Also, very, very good advice just generally to keep garments out of sunlight and to keep them somewhere where the heat and humidity stays very regular. That will help you um, conserve your garments for a long time. I see another question from Sarah. And she asks, does the museum have many items in its textile collection? That is an excellent question. Sorry, I'm kneeling here, so I'm a little trying to get comfortable so I can answer your questions. Uh, the museum has many items in its textile collection. We've shown you a few in our programs. Um, it also depends on whether you are asking about the true artifact collection or the education collection. Our education collection probably has mm, probably has somewhere around a hundred pieces that can be worn and safely uh, um, handled. Whereas our textile collection, our true historic pieces, I know that we have several hundred. Um, we've been trying to uh, show them a bit more. We have so many garments that we actually want to be able to present them uh, in a much better way. So it's something that the museum is actively trying to, um, to promote is our textile collection. We have not only uh, dresses and kind of accessories like our top hat, but also things like helmets, uh, things like shoes. We also have some children's garments and we also have other textiles like um, rugs and quilts. So hopefully further on in our series and in some of our future uh, true physical exhibits, you'll be able to take a look at some of these items. Let's see if we have any other questions here. I don't see any others. We do have some comments. Um, Ramin says, at the time, in the 1950s, yep, uh, or just prior, I suppose, in the 1940s and 30s, uh, the YMCA in Westport was on the site of the old Westport Hotel, which today has uh, the Bedford Square Shops and Anthropology. And that's very, very true. The, the YMCA has, has changed locations during its, during its long history in Westport. So that is it for tonight's presentation. I do hope that again, you will support us on Giving Tuesday and throughout all of the year. We love when you come and uh, take part in our programs, either online or when you can come in person again safely. Uh, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Next week, we will be taking on the subject that we've called Under the Skirt. So we'll be learning a bit more about these foundation garments, things like corsets, crinolines, chemises, um, things like that, that actually helped build out the silhouette and let people wear beautiful garments like this. So please join me next week. Have a wonderful evening and everyone please stay safe.